Hello, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Dario. I teach at the Institute for History in uh, Leiden. And it's an honor for me to have today the possibility to have a conversation with uh, Dagomar de Groot, uh, who is a fellow historian uh, and a professor from Washington, D.C. Welcome, Dagomar. Welcome uh, back in Leiden, as you said. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, you will be talking today, we will be talking today about your career, your books, your research interests. And first, I want to uh, briefly introduce you also for our uh, viewers. So you are an associate professor of environmental history at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Uh, you wrote uh, an amazing uh, first book that is titled The Frigid Golden Age, and that was published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. It won several prizes and it was named one of the best books of that year by the Financial Times, so congratulations to that. Uh, you're also working on another book that is titled Ripples in the Cosmic Ocean. It's about a history, like a broader history of our solar system and universe. It's fascinating. And it is under contract with Harvard University Press. I've heard it's going to come out soon. So congratulations on that too. Um, you've been publishing extensively, not only uh, in several outlets, so not only in scientific journals, but also with popular presses. Uh, you've been publishing articles in the uh, uh, American Historical Review, in Nature, but also in the Washington Post, in the conversation. You have been writing several blog posts. You have your own podcast uh, on climate history, and you've been sharing your perspectives, your research interests, widely, not only with academics, but also with policymakers, journalists, corporate leaders uh, uh, from your home base in Washington, D.C. So it's a great pleasure and really an honor for us to have you here today in Leiden for this uh, uh, seminar series. Now, before digging deeper into your research interest, into uh, the, the things that um, uh, you do, I would like you to explain as who you are. So you are a Dutchman and then you live in Washington DC. What, how did you land there? What's your path? Sure, yeah. And Dario, the honor is mine. It's so great to be here with you, talk to you. Um, yeah, so I, I was uh, born not that far away from here, pretty close to Horicum, a little town called Ramsdong Sphere, which doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. Um, and then my family moved to Canada when I was three years old really to the middle of nowhere, southern Ontario, which is actually pretty densely populated, but a corner of southern Ontario called Waynefleet, which is really, there's more cows than people in that town. And I remember growing up thinking about, you know, times that were very far away, places that were very, very far away, trying to sort of catapult my mind out of that little town. Um, so thinking about space, thinking about climate, thinking about ancient history. Um, and then eventually I went to university and studied uh, history and English. I had no idea that environmental history existed. And I felt a little bit disappointed, to be honest, to be studying history, because really my first passion was science. And I just wasn't quite good enough at math, I didn't think, <laughs> uh, to be a scientist. But then I did discover environmental history when I was doing grad school, and I landed on the idea of trying to figure out how different populations long ago coped with natural climate changes, the kind of climate changes that came about in the wake of volcanic eruptions or, or changes in solar output, solar activity. And gradually, only gradually did I realize that I was not exactly inventing a new field, but um, you know, becoming part of a broader community. Uh, really only after I started my PhD did I uh, reach that conclusion. I landed on studying the history of the Dutch Republic because I still knew Dutch, um, and it, it dawned on me that the coldest stretch of a generally colder period known as the Little Ice Age coincided with a lot of very important, momentous Dutch history. And I wanted to see whether the Little Ice Age had catastrophic impacts in some way on the Dutch Republic. That was really the tone of the field at that point. And only gradually did I realize, well, maybe actually the relationships I were looking for were reversed. Uh, in some ways, climate change benefited uh, the Dutch Republic. We can talk about that later, of course. Um, so I got really into climate history. Um, 
and, and really into trying to figure out what the past could tell us about the present and the future. Mm. One other reason I got into climate change is because, you know, I, th I think a lot of us in history, we always think, well, how can we be relevant? How can our work um, be important today? And, uh, and of course, I thought, you know, climate change is maybe the most important issue now. Um, so then, you know, I finished the PhD and I moved for my postdoc to the University of Western Ontario, which is now goes by Western University, did a year there, and then a job opened up at Georgetown looking for a kind of big environmental historian. Environmental historian who covered a lot of ground, working with John McNeil, who does a lot of big, 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 big history. Um, so luckily they hired me, they hired somebody called Timothy Newfield, who also covers a lot of ground. Um, then, yes, yeah, so at Georgetown, I started to think about bigger and bigger topics and uh, not just about the challenges we face in the future, but also potentially the opportunities. You know, it's good not to get too depressed. Climate history can really make you depressed. Um, so from that came my book on the solar system, which is, I just submitted it a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, hopefully it will be forthcoming pretty soon. Exciting, yeah. exciting. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, you've been giving us already a lot of, lots of interesting hints for, for this conversation. One is that, you know, uh, positionality, if you want, in a way, our own personal histories, they count in defining what we are and what we do, right? So you said you grew up in places with wide open spaces and there you realize the importance of the natural environment. I wonder to what extent, and this is something that also Deepesh Chakrabarti says very often, to what extent children who grow up exclusively in urban environments can really have that idea, that exposure to environment and can develop that sort of interest that eventually led you to this, this career. Uh, and then, you know, we share also another thing, that it's the fact that we are not good at math. <laughs> I totally feel you. <laughs> let, me, let me comment on one thing quickly about children growing up in urban environments. And my children are growing up in an urban environment now. So this is something I think about sometimes too. Do you see those a little bit unique? It has a lot of green space, um, some parts of the city anyway. But, you know, you never really know what ultimately has an impact on you, right? Is it the way, the, the general milieu in which you grow up? Is it perhaps that trip out to the countryside, right, that, that uh, resonates? Or perhaps if you grow up in an urban environment, you are more interested in nature because you see it kind of reshaped, broken, altered all around you all the time, right? And, um, and ur you know, urban spaces have their own unique environments as well. So I don't know, it's, uh, it's always difficult to know exactly how yes. things influence. But there's, if you want another step to be taken there, because you need to go out from that environment, then it means that you need to, aff to be able to afford it most That's of the true. time. So, yeah. uh, whereas, you know, in a pre-urban age, exposure to environment was really different and That's something right. you, you could not really escape. We'll go back to that point, but uh, first I wanted to ask you something about you know, climate history, you know, the, your, your own field of study. Uh, how you defined it very, you know, in a catchy way in several articles and things, but how would you define it? And uh, do you think that only one climate history exists or shall we rather talk of climate histories? Yeah, it's a good question and it's a confusing topic, to be honest, because there's a lot of terms that have slightly different meanings. So there's paleoclimatology, historical climatology, climate history, and something I um, coined, I guess, the history of climate and society. So let's start maybe with the first one. Paleoclimatology is the effort by scientists to reconstruct or identify how climate has changed using the so-called archives of nature. So aspects of the material world that still register the influence of climate change in the past. So that's paleoclimatology. Historical climatology is pretty much the same thing, except undertaken by historians using the so-called archives of society. So the kind of sources that we're usually most familiar with, but stuff created by people. Then climate history is the, it's the effort um, by historians to determine how climate change has influenced human history, how climate as well, not just climate change, but climate had that kind of influence how different cultures understood climate and climate change. The history of climate and society, however, is the trans and multidisciplinary effort to identify social responses to past climate changes. Historians are part of that effort, 
but honestly, probably not the most important part. There's archeologists and geneticists, historical linguists, geographers, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so there's all these different intersecting communities and honestly, they all need each other. But this is very interesting because you, you keep talking about climate changes mm -hmm. and using the plural for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think this is like widely known and understood that there have been many climate changes and many you know, forms of adaptation or well, many resilient paths to that? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. It's also a little bit tricky though. Um, so I mentioned climate changes and really, Climate change is defined as a change in average weather that lasts for about 30 years. More specifically, the mean and or variance of weather changes for uh, about a 30 year period. That's a classical definition. It's been contested um, by different groups, partly because it doesn't seem to take into account the speed at which climate can change, is changing now. Um, People in my field also look at climate anomalies and regular climatic variability. So they look at climate in all its different expressions, really. Um, and is it generally known that climate change is not just something that happened with uh, the industrial period and, and human greenhouse gas emissions? Um, I don't think it's, it's widely known. At the same time, it's a little bit difficult, as I mentioned, because what's happening now is distinct, right? And when you use the term climate change to refer to everything before the onset of industrialization, you do or you run the risk of leaving the impression that what's happening now has many different precedents, which means we shouldn't care about it that much, right? And so for that reason, some people prefer the term, um, well, climate variability when they're talking about the past. I don't, I think that means something meaningfully different uh, than climate change. Um, so, but leaving that aside, uh, yeah, you know, the climate has changed in profound ways. In the Holocene geological epoch, globally, changes in average temperature were not that big, certainly smaller than what's happening now. But regional and local climates could really change profoundly and thereby meaningfully alter human history, I think. Um, so those histories, I think, are very important to uncover. And I think you're right that the field has focused primarily on examples of crisis and you know, purported collapses, mm -hmm. not nearly enough, among historians anyway, uh, on resilience and adaptation. But surely those stories are important too. We'd really like, I think, ideally to have uh, a more resilient and adaptive society as we go forwards. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I absolutely agree with you because you know, one thing is to talk about climate change within the context of the Anthropocene or the, the Great Acceleration, if you want. And we know that you know, the, the, the pace and the scale of these changes are, are in a way unprecedented, especially the, the kind of anthropogenic role of, in these changes. Yet talking about climate changes, taking a much more longer, wider chronological perspective allows you to avoid some sort of climate determinism as if you know everything that is happening now is because of this climate change. No, it has happened also in the past and people have reacted in different way, which is what I basically learned from your book, from reading your book. Your book is also a story of, of, in a way, success. So it's not just uh, one of those like doom-like or doomed narratives about climate change. It's a story of a successful adaptation, right? Of, 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 uh, of institutions and people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't wanna ask you if you think this is, again, applicable to these days because we live in, as a matter of fact, in another different geological era. But what are the main takeaways you take from that story, from the story of the frigid or the little ice age? It's a great question. And I think the, the main takeaway maybe is, is uh, quite simple actually, which is that things are often more complicated, less obvious than they appear, right? Um, and I think in this field, and I will use the term history of climate and society, I think the narratives that are told are very simple and very powerful actually as well, which is that when societies faced um, a change in climate, like a mega drought, a drought that lasted for at least 30 years, for example, that there was really only one major response, which would be to collapse or to endure a crisis that's resulted in a profound transformation of that society. Those are at least the most influential narratives in the field 
communicate that basic idea. There's many different case studies from the supposed fall collapse of the Western Roman Empire, ancient Egyptian dynasties, the classical Mayan city-states, uh, Vikings in southwestern Greenland. You go through one example after another after another where the same pattern repeats itself. And of course, embedded in that history is a warning that if we don't get our act together, we're going to fall apart, right? And so that's a, I think it's a powerful story. It's a valuable story. And it's um, a, res a story that resonates, I think, in, in productive ways, honestly. Um, but when I started <laughs> uh, researching the Dutch Republic, I realized that it had been incorporated into some of these narratives already in a kind of um, patchwork sort of way. Jeffrey Parker's Global Crisis is a great example of that. In many respects, a, a very important and valuable book, I think. But the Dutch Republic are included as an example of a state, yeah, as a society that endured disaster. Why? Because there were a number of political crises, of course, in the history of the, of the 17th century Dutch Republic. Again, I think that's not useless. I think that's important to, to um, talk about. But if you look beyond those political crises, you see a much more complicated pic uh, picture. It's not a picture, I think, just of success. Uh, I think um, ordinary people suffered horribly during these years, partly because of extreme weather events that, for example, breached dikes, and thousands of people flooded, partly because of um, human responses to different climatic circumstances, like the freezing of waterways that otherwise created barriers for invasion. Right? When those things froze, the Spanish armies, for example, uh, marched right over. Um, so there is a degree of suffering in the book. And if I wanted to bring that uh, to greater attention, I, I could have. I could have expanded the book and focused on that a little bit more. But at the same time, if you look at things like commerce, um, military campaigns, uh, cultural, um, new kind of cultural expressions, the story is of... Um, a society that coped in diverse ways with climate change, sometimes in, you know, by being flexible people, groups of people were flexible, sometimes by um, being resilient, resisting damage. But at the same time, often the resilience of the metropole, an imperial sort of center, the city states, or sorry, city state, the cities of the coastal Dutch Republic came at the expense of other people all around the world, right? So is it a success even for those cities that thrived? It's more complicated than that. In a way, the book also shows that resilience is, you know, you have to be careful in defining that simplistically as success. Um, but yeah, so the overall picture, though, is that, you know, climate change has kind of ambiguous impacts on a society. And after I finished the book, I, it increasingly dawned on me that this must not just be a Dutch thing, right? There must have been many populations that also uh, coped with climate change in these contradictory, ambiguous, in some many cases, successful-ish ways. Um, and that motivated my research uh, um, that I published in scientific journals, for example, and motivated me to get together groups of like-minded scholars uh, to pursue that kind of research. Yeah, in fact, what I really, really like in your book is that it's an example, you know, of this kind of planetary turn taking seriously. You know, you are really exploring not just development that are affecting societies or people's organizations or institutions, but their interdependency between these developments and changes that affect the climate or the geological systems of the planet. It's revealing, and I, I think that is, that's been one of my main takeaways <laughs> of your book, that these things, you cannot really separate them. You cannot really write a history that is purely institutional or social history without taking into consideration the variables that are coming from the environment where these people live. So thanks a lot for that, uh, for doing that. I think that if I put my, myself into the shoes of the historians who will be watching this video, 
uh, they said, okay, you've been talking about contents, you've been talking about approaches, definition, but ask him about sources. Sources, sure, you know, yeah. so historians always yeah. want to know about sources, especially because you say that you know there are several ways of doing climate history. Uh, of course, you can do this with ice sampling or by looking at the tree rings. Mm -hmm. But how do historians, as you know, as us, mm -hmm. do this kind of history? Which kind of sources? They use their confounder, and your sources are very, very interesting. Yeah, so uh, you asked me earlier, are there many different climate histories? Mm -hmm. And I think, I didn't get to that, uh, to answering that, but I think the answer, it must be that yes, there, there are. And I think that's okay. Um, where I think there can be a problem is where um, people pursue a particular way of doing climate history, that perhaps leads them to use sources they don't fully understand. And the biggest danger there is using the so-called archives of nature, right? Um, which are unearthed by paleoclimatologists. So you mentioned tree rings yeah, or, or layers and ice cores or lake bed sediments. So this goes on and on. There are dozens of these things. And uh, they've been accessed all over the world, some places far more than other places. And of course, paleoclimatologists take them, sample them, um, and turn them into beautiful graphs and maps, usually with um, filters, you know, to show nice smooth curves. And then we as historians can sometimes uncritically take those graphs, take those maps and assume, oh yeah, so this century was really cold, this century was warm, we'll call this century, oh, I don't know, this, these years, the Grindelwald fluctuation here, and then we've got this warm period here, and, Everything is neatly categorized that way, right? And um, we have to be very careful in doing that. We have to try and, you know, this is very difficult to do, but try to understand the kind of terminology used in these paleo sciences, uh, try and understand the different cultures, right? The different communities and how they interact, what they see as being, uh, you know, um, significant and not significant. Um, trying to learn more about methods. These things are all very difficult to do unless you're an insider. So what I've, and we mentioned this also in the Nature article and some of our other work, what I think is increasingly valuable is to actually work in partnership with scholars in different disciplines. Because you are never going to know as much about paleoscience as a paleoscientist. There'll be things that, maybe you can understand the character of the field, but the specific data that these people are generating um, will be very difficult for an, still an outsider to interpret. So if, if I get you right, I mean, what you're saying is that uh, scientists can give us the data that we can use for our works, but it's only historians to develop a sort of narrative, even around the understanding of the, the contemporary reception of, the, of those data. Well, I, I would even go one level maybe further and say that um, the scientists can give us data we have to be very cognizant of how those data are created. And in some ways we can comment on that perhaps better than a scientist. Um, you know, take, taking into account the power structures that lead to these data being available, but not those. But in many respects, the, the scientists will know a lot more about what the data actually represent. What are the uncertainties, for example, in the data? And that will be really meaningful for us, right? I'll give you an example. There are different ways of reconstructing the climate of the Little Ice Age. You can use different ensembles from the archives of nature, which may have more or less resolution or precision. And you can statistically interpret them in different ways. Now, do they tell us something radically different about the Little Ice Age? For a paleoscientist, not really. They all tell us that the Little Ice Age was cold, at least in some decades, and that that cooling extended across much of the Northern Hemisphere, and in some decades across parts of the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, if you're a climatologist, that's what you may need to know. But as a historian, it makes a very big difference if the climate over Horicum, for example, was uh, you know, 0.2 degrees Celsius cooler than the 20th century average in, I don't know, 1619, or 0.5 degrees Celsius cooler, right? This can really make a very big difference, averaged out over the course of a year. The paleoscience data does not necessarily tell us that. They can appear to tell us, but they don't tell us. And so for some contexts, you may need the archives of societies, and, and we are quite well versed in using those. Um, but often you have to infuse uncertainty into your narratives. You can give probabilities that something mattered, 
But it's a little bit different than other forms of history where you can say that X caused Y, right? With, I think, a, a greater degree of certainty. So you really have to think, if you've read the IPCC reports, for example, you'll see a lot of language about um, this is very likely, this is almost certain, this is uh, maybe certain uh, or maybe likely. Um, and so I think that kind of probabilistic sort of thinking is useful. Um, but I also, again, then think that creating what we call consilient partnerships with scholars in other disciplines, where you sit down together and come up with research projects is a good way to go. Not always viable for historians. Um, we, you know, many departments still privilege the single authored monograph as like the ultimate example of what you can do in the field. So there's an extent to which especially junior scholars have to be careful in becoming part of these collectives. But I do think it's a, it's a, a good best practice for this field. Yeah, I think we are slightly moving forward to that sort of framework and especially, you know, within environmental humanities and the cooperation with environmental sciences, these are becoming luckily way, way more and more popular today, even, you know, at the level of those managers who eventually will decide about funding, you know, which is yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, well, I, I will say, though, it differs a lot from one national context mm -hmm. to another. Yeah. I, I think in Europe, it's quite a different picture, honestly, uh, as you know. Um, and, and here, this kind of, you know, creating teams and all that kind of stuff, yes, that's how you do things. In North America, not so much, right? Um, there, it really, if you do that, if you cooperate, then getting teams with scientists, that is um, uh, risky. Okay. But you have been doing this, you know, also quite successfully in this case, and I can use this word again, because uh, you, you've been uh, putting together a climatological database uh, online, right? And I assume that comes from a cooperation with fellow scientists, right? Yeah, we do a number of those things. Um, so publishing in scientific journals, I found to be extremely rewarding with large groups for many different reasons. Okay. One is that if you, if you publish in a big scientific journal, of course, the reach is, is much bigger. And I think in environmental history, we often think, well, how do we plug into policy conversations, right? Uh, and there's a, one of the wonderful things about environmental history is that it can be so rooted in present day problems, right? And um, whether that involves informing activism or, you know, the kind of work that I do more of is, is policy. Policymakers read nature, but they don't often read uh, environmental history, unfortunately. At least, you know, in those circles that I'm more familiar with. And when I say policymakers, you know, I don't know if, if uh, Donald Trump is reading Nature, but um, yeah. actually, I do know that he definitely isn't. You could have said, <laughs> reading people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he looks at pretty pictures. But but you know, people who work, for example, in, in uh, the UN Development Program, uh, they will read those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so so that presents an opportunity, and then if you work together as a collective. It's really exciting because, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, you know, everybody benefits from that. I mean, I, I wanted to briefly touch upon your uh, current work, but you are opening now a, a discussion that I also wanted to do with you, which is about, you know, the relationship between academia and activism. You are very engaged in this, and I mean, you are outspoken also about that, that you can be a scholar and you can be, you know, invested in, uh, you know, presentist debate in, uh, you know, bring, bridging the gap between the study of the past and the life of the present, right? Which is something that I completely agree, but it's sometimes something that is criticized, right? You've been establishing a crucial network, you know, of fellow scholars who think about climate changes in this way. Mm -hmm. So would you like to tell us more about that? Yeah, well, you know, uh, anybody certainly who's part of the AHA, the American Historical Association, will be familiar with some of the debates around presentism, which I find really tedious, to be honest. Um, uh, first thing I would say is that I think I, I don't fully understand why people want to uh, force people to do history in a particular way, right? If you want to do history just out of curiosities, uh, sake, I think that's wonderful, you know, and I think that should be encouraged. Um, but I don't think that we can really escape doing our work with the present in mind. We are, after all, people who live in the 21st century, and we live in a period of, I would say, 
um, unique uh, existential risk. Much of it, the majority of it, created by our rapidly expanding powers as a species, right? And climate change is a good example, far from the only example of that. And living in this unique time, which Toby Ord, a, a philosopher, calls the precipice, a time of uh, unprecedented peril and opportunity, living in that time, I think, also cannot help but shape how we do our work, right? Implicitly or explicitly. I prefer to do it explicitly. And um, if you study climate change, I think just about everybody who does climate history does so because they want to understand how climate change influences human behavior, right? Um, or the history of climate and society more broadly. Everybody who does that does it with that in mind, I think. Um, and I think that's perfectly okay. Now you might argue that if you examine the past with the present in mind, you will distort how you understand the past. It's the old uh, accusations of presentism. And that is something you have to guard against, of course. But, you know, again, I think it's, it's unavoidable. I have to say that I totally subscribe to this view. I mean, you, you cannot study the past or teach the past uh, in a void, uh, you know, isolating yourself from what's going on. And it would be counterproductive also. Uh, it goes against the fact that what you are doing is not only, you know, kind of translating this knowledge into new eras, but you're also, in a way, shaping future citizens, not only yeah. students. <laughs> and that's where the responsibility stems from. So that's why I also wanted to thank you, honestly, for the, the kind of work that you've been doing with the Climate History Network, because it's, you know, it's good to know that there are fellow historians out there who think in this uh, same way. The other thing I wanted to ask you about your current work is that it seems to me that in a way you are fascinated by the unknown. Mm -hmm. you know, most of your work, or your first work has been focusing on the oceans, on the ocean's death, on the ocean's changes, which are among the most fascinating parts of the world, precisely because we still know almost nothing about the oceans. Uh, and I think also we should know more about the relationship between human developments and water bodies in general. Uh, and now you are pushing the boundaries of these unknown even beyond the, 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 the physical, the geographical boundary of our planet. Is this right? I mean, is this what drives you toward the outer space? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, I do find uh, both topics, the, the, the oceans and outer space, I, I, you know, of course, I call it the cosmic ocean. Um, it's a metaphor that Carl Sagan popularized. Uh, we are on the shore here on Earth of the cosmic ocean, right? And someday we might set sail um, and go very far indeed into that ocean. Um, there are similarities, I think, in uh, ocean history and space history and in the environmental history of both uh, domains. Partly in that both environmental histories were kind of, I would say, under the, very underdeveloped 10 years ago, especially probably outer space history, but also ocean history. And in both areas, there's been a tremendous amount of growth over the last 10 years, as you know as well as I do. Um, I, I think the reason that they were underexplored is because both spaces seem unknown and unbounded and bereft of change almost, right? Too big to change in a sense. And I think, yeah, a lot of my work is showing that these are not just sort of stages for human action, but dynamic in their own right, volatile in a sense, on gargantuan scales, right? uh, especially outer space, of course. Gargantuan scales that may make it seem like they don't change for us, but every once in a while you get a visceral sort of reminder um, that they are anything but stable. Um, been many reminders lately, ocean temperatures this year are, you know, at unprecedented levels. Um, and recently we had a spectacular comet in Neowise. But, but anyway, um, whether I'm drawn to these things because of the unknown, yeah, I, I think so. I, I love that idea of um, kind of the thrill of discovery in a sense, and of making relationships that I feel at least that few people have made before. I think that kind of drives me. In a sense, it's, um, 
it's almost a kind of, uh, maybe I'm wrong about this, but a kind of way a scientist might sometimes think. And I think I, I do think <laughs> maybe too much as a, as a scientist might think, um, which leads me then also to work easily in cooperation with scientists. Um, uh, just, yeah, so no, nothing wrong about that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely fine. No, but I, uh, I also wanted to ask, I mean, because there are many parallels indeed between the oceans and the outer space, also in the ways in which we perceive and tend to organize this space in a way that is functional to human needs. Uh, systems of governance, for instance, uh, the law of the sea is in a way guiding the ways in which we've been regulating the outer space. Do you think this will be the case also for the kind of anthropogenic impact that we are having on the outer space in terms of exploitation, extraction, or if you want even commodification? Of absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think uh, absolutely. I think that there are governance structures now which um, are highly contested, um, but that have, that in theory, shape uh, how space agencies and companies can interact with um, outer space environments. They are contested in part because they, um, so the Outer Space Treaty in the 1960s, they can be interpreted as a limiting ownership of space environments. Um, particularly those resources that can be extracted, let's say, from the moon or from asteroids. And of course, as long as that treaty is interpreted in that way, the space cannot be commercialized. Um, or I shouldn't say that, but um, uh, mining, actually extracting from space environments in that way cannot be commercialized. Of course, space is already commercialized all around Earth. Uh, it's on its way to becoming a trillion dollar industry. But anyway, the moon and the planets, you can't really create a cis lunar economy, let's say. And so in the United States, there have been kind of unilateral uh, attempts to redefine um, what companies can do. And I, I think that will be completely inevitable as long as there is a perception that it will be useful to actually extract stuff, let's say, from the moon. Um, it's going to be done, right? And so we live in what's often called a kind of new space age, right? New space companies being developed, but it's not just companies, but governments that are perceiving space in a new way, right? As a, a place where, yeah, you can, you can build solar power stations, for example, and alleviate pressure on Earth that way. Or you can maybe mine the moon and asteroids and build unprecedented infrastructure in space and, and gain profit that way. It's a kind of a wild west, I think, and, and that will continue. But that's precisely my question. I mean, do you think this is a new way of approaching it? Because if I think of Kennedy, the new frontier rhetoric, it seems to me like the replication of settler, settler colonialism mm -hmm. but then brought you know, outside the boundaries of this planet. Well, it's, it's been argued that there are strong parallels there. Um, there have been calls to decolonize space exploration and exploitation. Some might argue that, of course, colonialism is not colonialism without people to colonize. So can you really colonize space environments that are bereft of people or likely life? Others would argue that no, colonialism is about more than subjugating people and forcing them into new life ways. It's about unequal systems of extraction that benefit the few at the expense of the many. So in that sense, yeah, perhaps we are moving into a more colonial moment in our relationship with space. You can also argue that that has deep roots going back into, yeah, the, uh, the 1960s or even the 1950s. Um, so I think all of those are uh, useful um, arguments. I think what is happening now is different though, because of these, partly because of these new space companies, right? These companies with the resources of space agencies but that are in many respects more efficient, thinking now especially of SpaceX, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, more efficient than space, many space agencies can be, and their ambitions can be more durable, I think, than we've seen NASA's ambitions be. Um, they're less beholden to the public. Um, but also, you know, there's new space agencies with unprecedented capabilities. The Chinese Space Agency certainly comes to mind, 
there's a growing militarization of space, and that has deep roots, of course, in fact, roots that probably definitely precede um, NASA. Um, but I think that's going to be more and more important. So much of how warfare is conducted now relies on space. Um, so it is kind of, you know, depending on what you define as space, but at least our cosmic backyard, I think, is increasingly being folded into modern capitalist and, you know, um, militaristic systems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a book that is coming out and it's about the oceans, but it's been, I've been using exactly the same terms, you know, defining the ocean as a disposable frontier, uh, the mercy of a military chemical industrial complex that is yeah. there, you know, just to exploit it. And it seems that, you know, the outer space is the next good candidate for this. Uh, so, sort of. Yeah, I think so. But it's also, it's, um, it's complicated by the fact that there is something, in my opinion, fundamentally, well, so the Ripples on the Cosmic Ocean argues that there is a greater connection between Earth and space than we might assume. Um, that Earth is not just floating in emptiness, but actually the solar system is a mosaic of environments that influence us. But at the same time, I think there is something different about what happens beyond our atmosphere. And in the sense, the exploitation of space environments then does have the kind of potential to ease pressure on terrestrial environments. I do believe that. And in that sense, ironically, what happens, this exploitation of space potentially could ease the exploitation of Earth. Now, it depends on how it's done, of course, and that's a whole other difficult conversation, and I, you know, I can see parallels there. But I also think we have to be a little bit careful in assuming, for example, that if we reshape the moon, that's the same as reshaping the Earth. I, I think there's more differences there than similarities. Okay, so you think that, can we say that one of the aims of your book is to uh, challenge the notion of, and the, the, the role of humanity in, uh, in our universe? A little bit, yeah. I, th I think you can define it that way. I don't know if I do in the book, but I think um, um, often when we talk about environments, we talk about life, right? Not always, but often uh, on Earth. Although we might refer to a volcano as a kind of an environment, you know, part of the environment. But usually we're talking about life. But in the book, I redefine that term a little bit to encompass kind of complex and variable systems that can be entirely lifeless. Yeah, and, and in that sense, um, and this is, by the way, this is not my idea. This idea has been floating around for a long time. But I do think, I mean, the universe was a dynamic and um, you know, changeable and rich place before there was any life on Earth, and it will be after. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so let's uh, set this on this deal. We will be starting from there. Our next conversation after your book come out, we'll be back to the Netherlands and we'll take it from there. This is all fascinating. I have like three final questions for you. Okay, one after the other. These are like uh, not strictly related to your research, but more to your own taste, to your own persona, if you want. First of all, tell me a non-history book that has been influential for you for your study. Now, uh, I'm going to mention this book series mm -hmm. because it's not just me who's been influenced by it, but I've come to realize over the last year or so that so many different people like me mm -hmm. have been shaped by it, and that is the Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a, there's a space empire spanning the galaxy, and it's beginning to fall apart. Nobody realizes it except for a cycle historian by the name of Harry Seldon, and he comes up with a kind of history that can be used to model the future. And using that history, he determines that, yeah, the, the empire is collapsing, but he also finds a solution whereby the so-called Dark Ages, this is really rooted in an old conception of medieval history, right? But the Dark Ages can be shortened from what I don't remember exactly, but I think it was 30,000 years to 1,000 years. Right, and how can that be done? By compiling human knowledge and storing it with a group of scientists on the other edge of the galaxy. Um, but it's what's I think so influential about it is the idea that our knowledge of the past can be used to better understand the future. And I think that's why, so I was just at the UN Development Program and a number of people said, yeah, you know, I read the Foundation Trilogy as kids and it really influenced us. So I think that book, as a kid, 
shape me in ways that I'm only now beginning to uh, recover. Great. Well, thanks a lot. This is a great tip. Another tip I want to ask you for is uh, an environmental source. So something that is also maybe available out there online that practitioners of environmental history or environmental studies can use. Well, we've got a number of these sources listed at historicalclimatology.com. And all of them, I would say, are hugely underutilized. One of them that I would draw attention to is called the CLIWOC database, the Climatological Database of the World's Ocean, Oceans. This was the product of a European effort to um, translate and quantify information in ship logbooks from 1750 to 1850. Um, and it's all out there on these giant spreadsheets. We put it into open, um, you know, open source format so anybody can download this stuff. And you can find uh, so, such rich detail in there, but very few people, I think at this point, have used it. Right now, I'm using it with an oceanographer, and we're trying to determine whether the oceans in the past were fundamentally different from the oceans of today because they had gigantic rafts, wooden rafts that covered space equivalent to large islands that might have housed uh, ecosystems that are now actually attached to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, for example. Um, but you can find all this data in there, and these data, and people, I think, have not used it enough. So that it's out there. Great. Well, I'm going to watch the recording just to <laughs> make sure I'm not going to miss this one. I mean, I'm very interested in these kind of things. And the last thing, also because, you know, by now, the, uh, the, the ones who will be watching this video till the end are really the ones who are interested in this kind of thing. So I want to give them something more. Since you are such a successful scholar and writer, share with us a good writing tip. So this is not my writing tip. This is something from... John McNeil and Dava Sobel, um, who've written for popular audiences, I asked them the same question, you know, how do you write so well, basically, in such an engaging way? Actually, after the Frigid Golden Age, I asked them this, because I wanted to write a trade press book, which I'm now doing. And they said, uh, write for a family member, so someone that you know or you love, who you want to communicate with, but who's not an expert in your field, who might not even like or care about your field, right? So write for that person in an accessible way and think of that individual, and then it will be better for you. So that's what I, I try and do now. Great, wow, this is mind-blowing. Thanks a lot, I wanna thank you for everything you do and for everything that you've been sharing with us today. Good luck with your future endeavors, you know, the many ones that you have. Good luck with uh, everything in your future. And please do come back uh, sharing with us more stories about your cosmic adventures, okay? <laughs> Thank, you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.